Hello and welcome back to God Loves Kids TV. We hope you've been enjoying this series, A Perfect Father. Now, Part 8, Jacob and the Blessing. Without further ado, here's Pastor Phil. About 18 years ago, I had the privilege of traveling with my dad to Israel. Now, this wasn't just your normal 10-day uh, trip to Israel that many have gone on. It, it was a spectacular trip. One of the things that made it spectacular is that we were there for three weeks. The other thing that made it spectacular is that we had 40 Bible translators and their families on this trip. Two large buses uh, on this trip going from place to place and hotel to hotel. And it was quite a job. My, my job was to be the uh, sheepdog, if you will, and keep everybody in line and moving forward. And that was, that was a, a full-time job, believe me from these Bible translators from all over the world. Some of them, some of their wives, in fact, had never used a Western toilet before. So we had quite an adventure uh, touring through Israel. The other thing that made it quite interesting was that we had Hal Roning, who was the president of the Home for Bible Translators in Israel. By the way, he is the highest paid tour guide in Israel. What, whatever the next highest paid tour guide makes, he makes double and so that's how he sets his fee but he joined us as an act of love for these bible translators for three weeks leading this tour and, and helping us to understand the nation of israel and the historical uh, aspects of scripture and and what was going on and during this time one of the most interesting things was that we stayed in a shabbat hotel now this shabbat hotel was essentially a modern day synagogue for a, a group of Jewish people who come together. It was, it was their synagogue. And what they did was on, on Friday night and Saturday, they moved their, all their families moved from all over the city into this hotel. And the hotel literally shut down except for the other guests uh, in how it operated. The, the elevators would stop at every floor so they didn't have to push a button. All the lights were on motion sensors, including the ones in the room. So for the lights to go off, you had to lay still in your bed for a minute <clears throat> for the lights to turn off. And, uh, and it was very interesting to watch this whole interaction. And what a tremendous community of faith that they represented it, how they had made a really a lifetime commitment to this synagogue. They had invested financially in this hotel. They owned the hotel as individuals in the synagogue and they had invested financially in it, but it was run for their benefit. And all the food that was served was cooked beforehand and served cold. Uh, they had Gentiles doing the serving and it was a very interesting thing. But one of the most interesting things for me is that I was able to witness the beginning of their Shabbat. And that happened on Friday night, and they began the Shabbat with the blessing of the children. And they blessed their sons with the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and we'll get into that later, but the reason for blessing with the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh is they were the two, first two brothers, the first two siblings to dwell in unity together, to have the same purpose of mind, to have the same goals, to really love one another. Uh, and then they bless the girls, and, and that is such a tremendous picture. And one of the reasons I believe the Jewish community has been successful in so many ways underneath the persecution that they've faced is that they have continued this aspect, this, uh, this aspect of worship, if you will, of verbally affirming their children with a verbal blessing. So what we have when it comes to the blessing is we have the process, the ongoing prevenient grace process that happens before we do anything, preveniently in our life. This process of blessing that takes, <clears throat> it requires action, it requires commitment, it requires an ongoing movement on our part to accomplish the process of blessing. It requires far more than words to accomplish the process of blessing. But we don't want to leave out the fact that there is also the affirmations of blessing that are necessary. We have to speak verbally over those around us that God has put 
in contact with us. And of course, the most powerful relationship in the blessing is the, is the relationship of parent and child. It is said that, it, and listen to this because it's very important. In fact, it, Randy, if you want to do a truth bomb here, now's the time. Uh, it is said that a child, a, 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 a parent's you are's become a child's I am's. In other words, what a parent proclaims of their children, you're lazy, you're no good, you're going to go to jail someday, becomes the child's internal dialogue. And that internal dialogue is a driving force in their life and it becomes, I'm no good, I'm lazy, I'm gonna to go to jail someday, or I am the righteousness of Christ, uh, or I'm a royal priesthood and a holy nation. I am set aside by God for his purposes. I have a yes heart toward the things of God all the days of my life. So as we proclaim <clears throat> the you are's over my, our children, they become that child's I am's. When my son Corbin was uh, in uh, preschool and we had established a new preschool in our church and, and uh, he was the, the first member of the first class of this preschool kindergarten and, uh, and that was going to grow into what was eventually a 60, 67,000 square foot building housing a school from K through 12th grade. Uh, it was an exciting process, exciting time of development building the building and everything that went with it. But uh, he came home telling my parents all the bad things that some of the other little boys had done in his class and were doing. And when he finished all these statements and, and literally tattling on the other boys in the class, he said, my parents asked him, my mom asked him, now Corbin, you don't do any of those bad things, do you? And he backed up and he put his hands on his hips and he said, no way, grandmother, I'm a man of God. And so you see that, that, that input into a child's life is so important because it becomes the internal dialogue, the, the inner voice, if you will, that, uh, that either tells that child the truth about their life or lies to them on a continual basis and drives them toward destruction. And if, it, you know, we can talk about the fountainhead of the verbal blessing, uh, which is found in the Old Testament, but I want to talk about the ultimate stamp of approval on a verbal blessing, and that's found in Luke chapter 24, verse 50 through 51. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them, now it came to pass that while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So Jesus <clears throat> is about to be ascended unto heavens to his father. And the last thing he does on earth is speak verbal affirmation over the people in his congregation, if you will. He ends his ministry with a blessing with a verbal blessing over the lives of his people. Now, there's a, a tremendous battle that, that is raging, the battle for hearts and minds. And our job is to set the stage for the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives. It's not our job to be God. It's not our job to be the Holy Spirit. And in fact, with the whole, out the Holy Spirit, no sales pitch, no logical thinking, no argument is going to bring someone to conversion. Conversion takes supernatural activity from on high involved in a person's life, and that activity takes place before the event of conversion. So God has already been working on them 10, 12, 13,000 steps to move them toward that point where they're willing to walk the aisle and give their life to Jesus, or they're willing to respond to your witness. So you might as well hang up the worry about whether or not I'm an effective witness or not. Just share your testimony, share what God's done in your life. And if it's the right timing, if it's God's place and time, that person will receive it. If not, you planted a seed and you're one of those two or three or 4,000 steps that God is taking that person on a journey toward him. So there's no pressure at all in you converting people. There's no use in us taking on that burden. I do not 
get people to, to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I present the reality and the truth of the gospel, and that's God's job, to bring them to salvation. Uh, you know, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborer labors in vain. And so why would we take that upon ourselves, that pressure, particularly those of us in ministry, that pressure to perform at a level and believe that, that if we had just done it right, that person would have come to the Lord. It's nonsensical. It, it doesn't work at all. <clears throat> and so one of the things that, that I believe is that the blessing is one of the greatest foundations that we can lay for the Holy Spirit to actively change someone, to change their behavior. 80 to 90% of all unproductive behavior is someone who lacks a blessing in their life, who is reaching out, seeking that blessing, seeking to have that hole, that void filled, <clears throat> seeking to have their I am statements changed by somebody proclaiming a new you are statement over them. A father figure reaching out to them and laying hands on them or just speaking from the pulpit their name and saying you are blank, blank, blank and, and giving a prophetic proclamation. In fact, <clears throat> more important than somehow dictating the future. Oh, I, I received a vision from God of the future, so I am a prophet. The role of the prophet in the church is really the role of verbal affirmation blessing someone toward a better future, proclaiming a better future on their life in a prophetic anointing is far more important than anything else a prophet can do in the church. And that is the ultimate role of prof prophetic is to speak verbal affirmation or proclaim the future that God has for somebody in their life over them in a way that brings life change to them. And if, if we look at the life of Jacob, this is a perfect example of God uh, uh, reaching into somebody's life at a critical point in time and bringing about change in their life. If we look at Genesis chapter 32, verse 24 through 29, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he, he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So, you know, anybody who tells you they know every reason that, that Jesus decided to show up and have a wrestling match, and yes, it was Jesus, have a wrestling match with Jacob uh, in the middle of the night, uh, bringing about change and altering his life and touching his hip, and, and going through this process. But, you know, maybe it was Jacob's strong will that Jacob was self-determined. In fact, I do believe that a majority of the reason this event happened is because Jacob, like so many Christians today, was a self-directed believer. Okay, he believed in God. He wanted the things of God to a certain level. But here's how his life with God operated. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to marry who I want to marry. I'm going to work at the job that I want to work at. I'm going to do everything that I do. And then I'm going to hold these decisions up after I made them and say, God, will you bless it? Did you hear that? I'm going to, I'm going to hold my decisions up after I've made them and pray that God will bless them. Pray that God will ordain them. Instead of seeking direction, for marriage or other things uh, uh, beforehand, he, he asked for blessing upon them afterwards. Now, this whole guy's life was built around this concept of re receiving uh, the blessing or the inheritance, if you will, of his family. I mean, everything. 
course, you know, his name was Deceiver, Supplanter. Uh, it, it'd be like, you know, uh, uh, Little Embezzler. Uh, you know, if you called your kid Little Embezzler or Embezzler, and that was his, his name throughout school, can you imagine the teasing he would have gotten? Uh, can you imagine how people would say, well, I'm not going to trust you with a loan. You embezzle money. Your, your label, your title is Embezzler. That's what Jacob lived with. He lived with supplanter. He lived with, with deceiver. Uh, his, his, his birth name and, and birth names had power, defined him as someone who was going to manipulate the situation. Someone who was going to try to control the situation to his benefit, was going to try to take shortcuts. And that was Jacob's name. And Jacob lived up to his name. His parents, you are's, become Jacob's I am's. Very clearly, his parents proclaimed a you are statement over him when he was born. And it became his internal dialogue. It became his motivational force in his life. Every time they called his name, he was reminded of the fact that his parents thought that he was a supplanter, thought that he was, he was somehow deficient in some way or another in character. And so in proclaiming that over him, that's what he became. And so he stole the birthright, if you will, and deceived to get it. And he received the blessing or the birthright from his father uh, to the point that, that it deeply wounds his brother. And, there, and he's afraid that his brother's going to kill him. And he leaves home. Uh, this is the type of family dynamic that many of us even face today. There's, there's a lot of adversarial roles among siblings and and uh, and it's, it's tragic and I faced it in my own life and it, it really is a tragedy uh, to have that kind of adversarial role one sibling being jealous of another or or something going on and and lies being told and that type of thing and I've personally experienced that and it's it really is a tragedy but the the bottom line is is that when Jacob gets to this place and he sees uh, Jesus and he starts to wrestle with him and Jesus knocks his his hip out of joint and wounds Jacob deeply and then Jacob grabs him and says I'll not let you go until you bless me now this is the guy whose entire life was built around receiving a blessing that he didn't deserve from his father and he manipulated to get that blessing and he finally did get the blessing but guess what he was not satisfied it was still in his heart why because if you manipulate to get something if you steal to get something if you jockey for position if you are self-directed in your life instead of being God directed if you're flowing in your own energy instead of flowing in the anointing of God if you're stepping out on your own strength instead of stepping out in faith when you do achieve something in life, it is not satisfying. It flow, Money flows through your pockets like water. Things that you thought would, would fulfill you, that, that trophy wife or whatever it is, you realize it doesn't work. When, when somebody rapes someone to have sexual pleasure, which most of the time that's not what it's really about, but that isn't fulfilling. When you hire a prostitute for sexual pleasure, that's not fulfilling to the person. It's outside the bounds of what is fulfilling in God's plan. And so when we allow ourselves to be self-directed instead of God-directed, when we have a self-directed heart instead of a yes heart toward God, then, then we'll never be fulfilled. We'll never be satisfied. You're going to see this in a moment. So as a young man, Jacob had experienced an event of blessing. And I think events of blessing are wonderful. One of the things the Jewish community does is a bar mitzvah. And that's an event of blessing. A wedding is an event of blessing. Those are phenomenal things and we shouldn't eliminate them. They're part of the whole package. But in, in addition to an event of blessing, we have the weekly affirmation of blessing that, that is the minimum happening in the Jewish community where they, they began their entire worship service with a blessing of the children. What a powerful thing to begin all your worship activities with the verbal affirmations, the you are statements that are putting into your child 
this powerful healing, deep healing. I mean, it's... We hope you enjoyed part eight in this series, A Perfect Father, Jacob and the Blessing. God Loves Kids is an international ministry dedicated to helping the neediest children in the world find hope for a new beginning and a better story. Please let us know if this teaching inspired you in the comments section. We'd love to get some feedback and to hear from you. Now, if the Lord spoke to you in this video, reach out and help us with our three ongoing missions in Utila, Nepal, and Uganda. All you have to do is follow the links below to contribute or visit our website, www.godloveskids.com. For more biblical teaching from God Loves Kids, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and click the bell so you can be the first to hear about all of our new content at GLK TV. And help us spread the word by liking and sharing all of this lesson with your friends and family. Join us next time for more of Pastor Phil. We can't wait to share more Jesus Christ with you. Until then, this is Randy Capes with God Loves Kids reminding you to love everyone you can. Amen.